So thanks. It's great to be here. I want to thank all of these organizations listed here for their tremendous support in bringing both um, a connection between human interests and science and also OSHEP, the uh, high energy physics community here in Australia, for helping to bring me here. And to Hugh Price especially because he and Roger Penrose were the two people who really got me thinking about the arrow of time in a serious way and thereby changing my life. And also uh, thanks to all of you for actually arriving here and thinking, just wanting to hear a lecture about this, especially because this morning I was doing a radio interview and we were taking questions from who knows where over the airwaves and over the text messages and so forth. And the final question we got was, oh, come on, isn't this all just Tosh? <laughs> and all that, I thought that was very charming because that's not the word we would be using in the United States. But also, one of the lessons that I hope to get across to you here today is that even though you might not think about the origin of the universe and the arrow of time in your day-to-day -day lives, they affect your day-to-day -day lives in a very tangible way. I want to argue that it is things that were happening when the universe was created that very much has set the stage for things that are very familiar to you in your everyday life, going through the kitchen, uh, just growing up and growing older, and all of that. So hopefully we'll connect these two ideas to each other and to other things that you might be thinking about all the time. So I should set the stage by defining what I mean by time. And it gets a little bit confusing because, of course, words are not invented in any logical way. We have used the word time long before we had scientific understandings of what it meant. So really, I just want to distinguish between two different ways in which we use the word. And time, of course, helps us keep track of things changing through time. You, you quickly find there's just no way to, to define the word time without using it itself. But there's two different kinds of things that happen as a function of time. One is that things repeat themselves. A certain kind of thing happens over and over again in a repetitive, predictable way. And of course, other things don't repeat themselves. They change, and they never change back. Both of these aspects are going to be crucial to understanding what we mean by time. Repetition is how we measure the flow of time, the passage of time. The fact that certain things happen and they happen over and over again, certain other things happen and they happen over and over again, and there's a synchronization between these things that happen. So way back, the first sort of knowledge of something like this is, of course, in ancient times, when we first kept track of time, we used astronomical clocks. We used what happens in the heavens to keep track of what time it was. You saw that the sun rose and the sun set, and it seemed that you had a feeling that it took about the same amount of time every day up to the seasons changing and things like that. But then what, how we would say it now is that the Earth rotates on its axis Every time that it revolves, sorry, the Earth revolves around the Sun, every time it rotates around its axis 365 and a quarter times. There's a predictable number of rotations of the Earth every year, every time we go around the Sun once. And it's that reliability, the, th the thing that something happens over and over again and something else happens over and over again the same number of times that lets us measure time. So we have the Earth spinning on its axis, we have the pendulum of a clock oscillating back and forth once per second, and we have a little quartz crystal vibrating. Why are quartz watches especially good? Because the vibrations of a quartz crystal are especially predictable and reliable. Every second, this quartz crystal is going to oscillate the same number of times. It adds up to about 2.8 billion times per year, per day. And you know that's going to happen. You know it's going to be the same number of vibrations between April 10th and April 11th as it is between April 11th and April 12th. When we have a watch, we know the minute hand goes around 12 times every time the hour hand goes around once. It's that repetition in synchrony that lets us tell what time it was. One simple way of defining time is it is what clocks measure. And clocks, of course, are just any example of this. Some things are not predictable. Some things you don't know when they're going to happen. But a clock is something when you know how many times it does something when other things are doing similar things themselves. So one example is, of course, in our bodies. We have biological clocks. We have slowly moving biological clocks and rapidly moving biological clocks. We have the beat of our heart. We have our breathing. We have electromagnetic pulses racing through our brain. If you have the feeling that time is moving more quickly or more slowly, that's because your biological clocks aren't always very good. Sometimes they start racing if you're excited or slowing down or if you're bored, and then you feel that time is passing in a different way. One of the first examples of this is Galileo. We're celebrating the 400th anniversary of Galileo pointing his telescope at the heavens. 
when he was younger than that, when Galileo was a youngster in Pisa, he would go to church every Sunday, just like any good Pisan boy would, but he would get bored sometimes, and rather than listening to the sermon, he would look at the chandelier. And actually, I don't have any idea whether or not this story is true, but it's so good, I'm going to keep telling it anyway. It's one of those apocryphal stories that would be better true than checked out. So here is an actual photograph of the chandelier in the cathedral in Pisa, right next to the Leaning Tower. And what Galileo noticed is that sometimes he would go in there and it would be oscillating quite a bit. There had been a gust of wind or people had walked by and the chandelier was moving back and forth. Other times it was only moving a little bit. But it seemed, roughly speaking, that it would always take the same amount of time to go back and forth. Even if it had further to go, it would also move more quickly to make up for that. And the time it took between oscillations was about the same. So you or I would notice that. We might even not notice that. But if we did, we would go, ha, that's interesting, and then go back to thinking about something else. Galileo wanted to test it. So he starts using his pulse and compared the number of heartbeats to the number of oscillations of the chandelier. In fact, he found that it was true. The chandelier took the same amount of time, took the same number of heartbeats per oscillation, whether it was oscillating very far or only a short while. This was the first discovery that pendulums are good clocks. They are reliable. If you push them back and forth and just let them go, they click the same number of times for every individual kind of pendulum. It's the simplest way we have of telling time outside of the stars and the planets. But the other aspect of time that is also very interesting is that some things change with time. Some things do not go back where they started. Europe did not go back to where it started after World War I. If you notice that Poland changed quite a bit. It didn't exist, and there you go. Uh, rock stars change quite a bit. Also, um, architectural styles change quite a bit. We all change quite a bit. In our lives, we are always born and then we die. And there is something about change that is not repetitive that is a different aspect of time that we have to pay attention to. Some things not only change, but they change in irreversible ways. They change in one direction, but they never change back. So this is what is defining the arrow of time, the difference between the past and the future. If you took a movie of a pendulum swinging backwards and forwards, and then someone played that movie to you in reverse, you wouldn't be able to tell. It would look perfectly good moving forward in time or backward in time. It's that simple of a system. But if you took a picture of people aging or a cityscape changing, you would know if someone played it backwards in time. It would look weird to you. There's a directionality that time has that informs how we think about the way things change. And that's reflected in the universe itself. The past of the universe is very different from the future of the universe. We know that the past is very different from the current state of the universe. The universe is expanding. Everything is getting further apart from everything else. So in the past, things were closer together and the universe was, was, was more dense and also hotter. In fact, we think, to a, we're not sure about this, but the smart money is betting that that expansion is going to go on forever. The universe is not going to recollapse. This is a discovery that is only about 11 years old now. It's part of the new story that he was mentioning to you. We thought for a long time that it was very sensible to imagine there was a big bang, the universe expanded and cooled off, but someday it would stop and recollapse into a big crunch. These days we don't think that. These days we think there was a big bang, everything was right on top of everything else. The universe has been expanding and cooling ever since, and it will continue to do so forever. That is a dramatic difference between the past and the future. As far as we can tell, the universe is not repetitive in any way. It's a once-in-a-lifetime thing. So what is going on here? What is the difference? What is it that makes the difference between these repetitive things that happen over and over again and these changes that can certainly define one direction? What physicists would do is define something called entropy. Entropy basically measures how disorderly a system is. And it, was, it first came into being in the scientific conversation in the early 19th century. And it's actually a very um, amusing story. Many of these great advances in physics were, were motivated by something other than absolutely lofty thoughts. In the case of entropy in the second law of thermodynamics, it was a French physicist and engineer, Saji Carnot, who was really upset that the British were building better steam engines than the French. So he tried to understand how steam engines work, the sort of the basic principles behind them, and he ended up coming up with a law of nature that later got promoted, and we understood it better, into the second law of thermodynamics. That says that entropy, a measure of how messy a system is, always increases or stays the same in a closed system, in a system that you just leave by itself. So if you go into your office and you have 
papers stacked very nicely and neatly in a perfect order. That is low entropy. Things are orderly. Things are arranged in a very delicate configuration. As time goes by, unless you tidy it up, those papers are going to become messier and messier until it looks like this. This is, does anyone know whose office this is? This is Alan Guth's office. Alan Guth is famous for two things. He invented the inflationary universe scenario of how the universe began, and he won a contest sponsored by the Boston Globe for the messiest office in the greater Boston <laughs> metropolitan area. And it looks like it's about as maximum entropy as it can get, but every time you enter this office, there's a slightly higher entropy than it did before. <laughs> so we feel this fact about change, that entropy tends to increase, that things naturally become messier. Things do not naturally clean themselves up. If you left this office alone and came back 100 years later, you would not find all of those papers stacked in nice, neat piles. Here is the classic example of entropy at work. We can take an egg and we can break it. We can scramble an egg. We can make an omelet. But no amount of work will help you make an omelet into an egg. And that is a universal truth, as far as we can tell. Everywhere in the observable universe, everyone agrees that eggs turn into omelets. Omelets do not turn into eggs. We can imagine someday visiting a different planet around a different star where life was not based on carbon or something dramatic like that. No one imagines we will ever visit a planet on another star where omelets turn into eggs. This directionality of time, pointing from the past, low entropy, orderly, to the future, high entropy, disorderly, seems to be an ingrained feature of everything that we see in the universe around us. So we would like to understand why that is the case. You can just say that it is the case. And in fact, in the 19th century, what they would have said is that's a law of nature. That's separate from everything else in the early 19th century. But later, they learned that, in fact, you could derive the second law of thermodynamics from underlying principles. It's not a law all by itself. It can be understood in terms of more elementary conceptions. So here's one way of thinking about what the second law says. If you have a billiard table, and you have some billiard balls racked very nicely, and you take a cue ball and you smack it into the billiard balls, they will scatter around the table. That process, going from the orderly arrangement of billiard balls to the scattered arrangement, is perfectly natural. If I showed you a movie of it, it would make sense. But this process, going from a scattered arrangement of, of balls, if I hit that cue ball, and it went into this nice orderly arrangement, you would be very surprised. That never happens. If I showed you a movie when it was happening, you would suspect I was just playing a regular movie backwards. You would not suspect I had actually given you a faithful representation of something that happened in nature. So this is one way of understanding. This is an example of the second law of thermodynamics in work. at work. You go from orderly, low entropy, to uh, disorderly, high entropy. The other one never happens. But this is a case where we can try to understand what is going on in terms of the billiard ball dynamics. Physicists love billiard balls. They always assume there's no friction and there's perfect understanding of what's going on. We should be able to understand entropy in the second law by imagining billiard balls smacking into each other. The problem is, if you simplify all the way down to just two billiard balls, there is no arrow of time anymore. There can't be. If you have two billiard balls smacking into each other and going off some way, it is a feature of the deep down laws of physics that they don't see any arrow of time. I could play this movie backwards, I could have the inverse process, and it will look just as natural to you. And that's not just a feature of billiard balls, that's a feature of all of the laws of physics from Isaac Newton to Maxwell to Einstein to superstring theory. As far as we know, the deep down laws of physics are invariant forwards and backwards in time. That raises the mystery of why there is an arrow of time in the world around us. The fundamental laws of physics are perfectly reversible. They go backwards and forwards. Why is it that the world around us doesn't look like that? This reversibility of the deep down laws of physics is in flagrant contradiction to everything we see around us in the everyday world. So this was figured out, in fact, in the 1870s by Ludwig Boltzmann. This is Boltzmann's tombstone in Vienna, and he has a, an equation on his tombstones. When I give this talk to physics audiences, I like to say, what is the equation that will be on your tombstone after you die? This is only his second most famous equation. I mean, they had multiple choice about what equations to put on Boltzmann's tombstone. So Boltzmann was the one, he didn't invent the idea of entropy, but he explained what entropy meant in terms of atoms. In the late 19th century,